Parsons in the room. We'll be hearing from him later, of course, our, our founding father. <laughs> And her mission is to help families and harmony through understanding. Um, today, Elaine is being sponsored by 33.7, so we're very thankful for their support and for allowing Elaine to join us and be with, here with us. So please put your hands together and welcome Elaine to the stage. Okay, this is not my canola field. It's my next door neighbors, but this is my couch. I am not a psychiatrist, I'm not a family therapist, but I have been accused of being a marriage counselor. So what we're going to do today is interact in a different way. Some of you have feedback sheets on your table. There were only 53 of them, but you can print or write this phone number down because you need this phone number. We've already been warmed up with Dave Mitchell. We've been warmed up with Sean Haney. And what was the theme of this morning? People are important. And your input is important because I'm a professional speaker and as my goal today here in this short hour that I have, and I am timing it, we are having a chime go off at 55 minutes after the hour. In one hour, how can this change your life? Talk does not cook rice. I've been to many farm management management seminars and workshops and conferences, and I have done Bridging the Gap with Cedric McLeod, who I miss dearly from New Brunswick. So if any of you from New Brunswick, please come up and speak to me after this. I also want you to know that there's people all over the world that are dealing with the same issues that you are as advisors, and I would like every farm primary producer in the room to please stand up. Would you please stand up right now quickly if you're a primary producer? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yes, some of us are having a harder time getting up, but clap for these people. They made your lunch. And that's important for me to know in terms of how I craft this today because you had Sean up here, and Sean and I have known each other for a very long time, and I know Sean's father, and I've met Sean's colleagues. And everybody has a story about conflict resolution. But what has to happen after this presentation today is that each one of you, like Dave said, has to come from inner direction to take responsibility to what your response is on your farm, your response at the Myers Norris Penny office, and your response and, at uh, Women in Agriculture de Quebec, and all the other places and people that you represent. Because it's all about, as Crystal McKay from utensil.ca says, it's all about the humans. And she's going to do a special summit in May, and it's a shout out to her and Brenda Trask and the rest of the planning committee to talk about managing people in agriculture. Because conflict avoidance and procrastination has to stop. Many of you, I think it was in Ottawa at our Farm Management Canada, conference, I don't know what year that was, but this year, Embracing Opportunities is the 30th anniversary. And I did update my bio, but I just turned 67 a couple of weeks ago. And a very dear, not so nice friend of mine said, Elaine, you are now in your 68th year. <laughs> oh, okay. But this is the slide that I want, and I'm going to say, send to Dave Mitchell. Because this is about what he said this morning. It, believing is important, what your core values are and, and what your passion and your mission is. But the middle piece is where I'm going to sit this afternoon. The middle piece is how do you behave in your workplace? How do you behave in your farm? And what decisions does your behavior impact? Because the culture of your farm or your workplace or your accounting firm or whatever you're representing here today, you, everything, the glue that holds this business together and makes it more profitable is how you behave and how you believe and how you decide and how you make decisions. So hashtag, I am the brown egg. Now, I have a prize. We use this in Huron County. On Thursday, we had 190 farmers. If you watch CTV, we had a clip on CTV. Huron County, you saw it. Huron County has some of the largest farms in Ontario, 
Billions of dollars of agriculture are at risk. Why? Yes, I am the brown egg, Elaine. I don't fit on this farm. Hashtag I am the brown egg. So you're going to get that as a prize if you fill out your digital feedback forms with the QR code. So you can start printing now. We have 45 minutes left. I also want to talk about conflict resolution skills as a great way to not get divorced. I wrote an article once called 14 Ways to Prevent Divorce on the Farm. And the reason I wrote this article is every farm, count them four, that touches our farm on mile 16 above the U.S. border in the International Peace Gardens is divorced. Five farmers went together in a consortium to help out our divorcing neighbor, who unfortunately was forced to sell his land after 32 years of marriage. According to Stats Canada, the median age of divorce in Canada is what? 46. The time for divorces to be finished, and especially farm divorce, is very complicated, 5.8 years. Yeah. The average age of a widow in Canada is 56. So we take all this family data and we go, what do we need to do? So this is your take-home assignment, first one. When you go home to your bride, which David was calling his bride, his bride, I love that. When you go home to your spouse or partner, I want you to write down numbers 1 to 12, each on a separate paper. And you are going to declare to your partner how you feel cared for because you are going to start paying attention to all these little pinch points and conflicts and irritations. Now, many of you know my husband, Wes. He was with me in Fredericton. You also know he almost died more than once, but the last time was December or October 2nd, 2017. But if you gave this list to Wes, the first thing on his list, I feel cared for by Elaine when she's got onions frying in the kitchen. He loves hot meals, okay? But the other thing we're going to pay attention to is not only the pinch points and conflict that you're experiencing, but how old you are. Now, you've just had a delicious, nutritious lunch, and I want to ask everyone in the audience who's in their teens to stand up, please. Anyone here a teenager? Yes! The students! All right, Lethbridge, right? You're all, and, and Mexico, Anna, put your hand up. She, if you want to speak Spanish with someone today, go to Anna. She'll speak Spanish to you. All right, you can sit down. That was your stretch break. In Huron County, I didn't start with the teenagers, and I missed the 19-year-old, so I'm glad you stand up. This is the future of agriculture right here. And I could just speak to the students today and not ignore the rest of you, but they're the ones who are not going to take being in the neutral zone anymore. They are the ones who are going to say, I am not going to do my life the same way. I'm not going to have an uncle who refuses to let me go to grandmother's funeral. And I know way too many sad stories in agriculture, and I'm sick and tired of them. And when Sean Haney and I talk on Real Agriculture Radio together sometimes, he goes, Elaine, when is this going to shift? This is going to shift when people start paying attention. All of you in your 20s, stand up and be proud of it and get a stretch break from your lunch. 20s, please stand up. One, two people in the room. All right. Oh, I didn't know how old you were. All right. If you're in your 20s, are you, yeah, I just say you stood up. I know you're not 20. You like, in your mind you still are, right? Yes. Yes. And that's another problem, isn't it? Newsflash, your grandfather, who is 95 years old and still holding on to all the equity, newsflash, he still thinks he's 21, right? In his brain, he's still 21. So in your 20s, it's about independence, and I hope you're not sleeping in your parents' basement, all right? 30s, all of you in your 30s, stand up. Yes, this is a great demographic for you, Heather, to know how old the people are who come to AgEx conferences, all right? So in your 30s, look at their eyes. If you, they're blinded by the light right now. But if in your 30s, it's exhausting because you're raising children, raising families, paying mortgages, and mastering success in your career, correct? And I hope you all get a really good sleep tonight after the conference banquet. That would be awesome. Okay, 40s. Now, this is where we start getting interesting. Whoa, whoa, there we are. C'est ça, c'est vraiment tout est bien. Okay, so the problem here is people in their 40s who have 62-year-old mothers or 62-year-old fathers and they don't have any equity in the farm, are they happy people? No. 
because by the time you're 40, it says you need to be taking charge and you need to be getting, getting certainty and security for your future. All of you in your 50s, these are those women and men who have stopped dusting furniture. Yes. <laughs> Quality of life, all right? In your 50s, you start thinking, how can I make my life less complex? Where can I find simplicity? What is my time actually worth? Of all the things that people are really longing for, what do they truly want? More money? More time. What would you pick? Time. Wait. Oui. The currency of life, okay? Now, in your 60s, all of you with me in my decade, get those knees cranked up, get the blood circulating. <laughs> this, yes, bon, okay. In your 60s, it's about what do you want your legacy to be? And I love Dick Whitman. I use a lot of his tools. I'm certified to use his tools. And Dick did an amazing thing in Calgary. Thanks, you can sit down. I'm sure you want to. Um, <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Dick Whitman has this amazing webinar clip that he did for Heather and Agex called, and you need to write this down somewhere, Stepping Back Without Stepping Away. Now, Mike Bossy's in the audience. I can't see where he is, but Mike and I are exactly the same age. He's over there. And Mike and I are longtime CAFA colleagues. I highly respect the work he's done in Tilsonburg, Ontario for many decades. But Mike and I had a lovely chat before today, or this morning, because Mike and I get a lot of pressure from people, when are you retiring? And the news flash is, we're not. Because we love what we do in working with farm families, and we are not just in a career, we are on a mission. And Heather said, my mission is to create harmony through understanding. Now, do we have any 70-year-olds besides Wilson in the room? Oh, they are there, Larry. Okay, I can see you back there. So again, kudos to Larry Martin and Wilson Laurie, thank you. You do some of your best work in your 70s, so let's give them a round of applause, absolutely. Now, if we were in Alberta, I would have to ask for the 80-year-olds and the 90-year-olds to come. Am I missing anyone? You might want to take this picture with your, with your iPhone or your smartphone right now before I click on to the next slide, because I paid $3,000 US for this, 20 years ago when I trained as a Hudson Institute coach. This is called Map 4. This is understanding in conflict resolution. Conflict, re conflict happens when people's needs are not connected. And if you are needing equity as a young farmer in Woodstock, Ontario, and your dad says, well, you know, you can't really afford the land, son, what is that gonna be? And for any of you um, who are listening to Heather earlier, she said, one of my favorite magazines is Say it, Heather. Country Guide. Tom Button and I are good friends too. And Maggie Van Camp, who many of you have read in Country Guide and has just retired from um, BDO and the National Ag League, uh, is a very dear friend of mine. And I respect a lot that's written in this magazine. But if you got this in the last week, please don't lose this. Because this is the essence of why I was asked to speak here today. And the country guide says, this new land, the challenge of high prices. Now you heard about wa wa la la, whatever, Washington and the great people this morning. He's gone for Thanksgiving. This is being recorded, so he'll get to watch it someday. But I spoke to the Ontario grape growers. There are 500 grape growers in Ontario. 28 of them and I had a long day together, together on August 14th before what I call the great pause that you all experienced on, in March of 2020. The land that the grape growers were buying for their vineyards was $50,000 an acre. Everybody got forced to stay inside for a couple of years. We had the great pause. The land in Niagara-on-the-Lake, where I was just on Sunday at a wine tasting at my new wine grower friend's house, is now $120,000 an acre, folks. This is why people are fighting. This is what we have to talk about. So today I'm just going to focus on one tool, which is called the conflict dynamic profile, which I can give you access to. But you need to understand there's a free tool that I'm happy to give you called the communication assessment. And we did this in Huron County. We did it last night on my coaching call in my room where I was speaking to 29 families. I have a new membership site. I call it Netflix for Farmers. 
I am 67, I hope to live to be 97, but if I only have 30 years left to help farm families find harmony through understanding and take care of their people, this is what I want them to know. So this is the communication styles assessment. Just put it on your sheet or in, in the digital QR code and tell me that you wanted. Some of you are action people. Some of you don't use enough words, like my husband Wes, I'll go back to this one. He phones me on the two-way and he says, Elaine, come pick me up at the barn. And I drive six miles to the pig barn that is no longer our pig barn. And he says, I say, I, I call him back. I said, Wes, I can't see any equipment. Where are you? He said, well, I'm at Henry's barn. I said, Henry's barn? You said the barn. And, I'm, and we're having a communication because those of you sitting in this audience who are very task oriented and let's get her done and talking is a waste of time. Does anybody on your farm say that? Talking is a waste of time. Have you heard that lately? Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes talking is a waste of time. You need to use more words, all right? So we solved our problem by burning Henry's barn down with a match, took 15 minutes and it's all good now. <laughs> and it was an old barn, so it was gonna be burned anyway. Some of you in this room are process communicators, much like I'm suspecting all the people in Myers Norris Penny, especially if you're in an accounting, linear thinking field, you like everything to happen, bang, bang, bang. And on the last line of this slide, I forgot the period just to bug you, all right? Because you're gonna say, Elaine, you got a bad slide here. I did that on purpose. Some of you are more like me, you depend on, on talking about relationship first, and yes, we'll get to business, but we want to connect, and we want to figure out, how are the grandchildren? I haven't seen you in four years, how are you doing, right? And you use word of mouth referral. And some of you are like my son when he comes home from university with his diploma in agriculture and he says, mom, we should have bison. Well, that would have been a good idea actually when he first came home 10 years ago, but now we have a saying on our coaching team, that was then, this is now. Can you practice that with me? That was then, this is now. Are you going to buy land in Niagara on the lake next week? Probably not, but Ma, um, uh, Mark Picon, my um, new winemaker friend and vineyardist, who's also a fabulous Italian chef, he said, Elaine, I bought this land 20 years ago. And he farms um, just, a, just 10 acres, but it's a very valuable property now. So we have all these different styles of communications, and again, you can ask me for that, and you find me on the feedback sheet or just at farmfamilycoach.com. But here's the essence. If you only take this home, and, and Sean was talking about nuggets, about just finding one piece of learning and training development today that's gonna really, really help you, is touch your head. I pledge my head to clearer thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to larger service, and my to better living for my club, my community, and, and the world. And I really wish Senator Black had been here this morning because he was the one who gave me the 4-H Canada Alumni Award in 2018. And that was the first time I met Rob Black, Senator Black, and he loves agriculture. But why I'm telling you this story is you, I cannot have any idea right now what you're thinking, feeling, needing, or wanting, because right now we're having kind of a one-way conversation, but you're doing a great job of listening. What is your intent? You should meet my mother-in-law. You know what she does? She goes into my house which of course used to be her house. And she goes down into the freezer and puts in fleisch perishki, which is meat buns for translation, and cinnamon buns and all kinds of great Mennonite baking for my husband Wes when I'm here in Guelph with you. Isn't that annoying how interfering she is? Okay, let's rewind the tape. You should meet my mother-in-law, Margaret Fraze. She's the farmer. Our farm is a matriarchal farm. It was her farm. They bought the farm from her father in 1945, right after the war when they were married, and Wes and I bought the farm from them in 1992, when land was $67,000 a quarter in Manitoba, not half a million, all right? So intent, action, effect. My mother-in-law is fantastic. What's the action here? My mother-in-law can be the person coming in and being annoying, or my mother-in-law can be what? very helpful because she cares about me as her daughter-in-law. So if you understand, here are the, the words I want you to start practicing in any kind of planning you do. What is your intent? Well, Lane, the intent is to keep the farm and the family. But look back at Sean's story. Sean's son, just so you know, is a really good baseball player. 
And Sean wanted to be a what? A sports broadcaster. And Sean's family is in the seed business, much like our family is, so Sean and I have known each other for a long time. And when he was interviewing these amazing students from Guelph, he said, what does it feel like to be forced to come back to the farm? What is the story that we're telling ourselves in agriculture that you always have to come back to the family farm? One of my coaches is first generation. She's been farming 10 years with her South African husband. They have a five-year-old boy. Go on Facebook, write this down, Luna Field Farm. She's a direct farm marketer, and thank you very much, with one quarter of land and a joint venture with a non-related par party who happens to be a Scottish immigrant farmer in Manitoba. They are making a really good living. So here's the other phrase I want you to hold on to. Where is it written that you have to farm with your family? And some of you are in this room because you're wanting coaching with me later today and just tap me on the shoulder and I'm happy to spend time with you. Is because you have to start taking a different perspective. So what this is on the, on the slide now is positive conflict behavior. Do you know what it feels like to be the mother of a large family business and have one successor coming in this store and say, I don't know what you're going to do with dad, but he's driving me crazy and I can't stand this anymore. And then dad comes in and says, I don't know what you're going to do with your child because your child is driving me crazy. Right? So what's happening here to mom, typically? Monkey in the middle. I had one, one dairy farmer in Chilliwack said, Elaine, I'm the pig in the middle. I don't know why she chose a pig. What's that? You like that one? I'll get you the magnet. I bought her a pig magnet, okay? So I want you to think about conflict is not bad. Unresolved conflict is horrible. So the first behavior that you want to think is, can you imagine what it would be like to get up every morning and say, yes, I get to farm with my mom. Yes, I get to farm with my dad. Oh, but I'll work on my sister. Whatever your story is. And I'm very thankful that in our family, Sean said it's a lie that there's no conflict on your farm, but we have a low drama farm. And just because there's drama in your workplace does not mean you have to attend the performance. You don't put up with bad behavior in your workplace or on your farm. And you just think about, and the question here for perspective is, what is it that you need that you're not getting? Very powerful question. Another one might be to my daughter-in-law who was raised in the city. <gasps> Did you hear that? She comes from the city. She says, Elaine, ever since I got engaged to Ian, people ask me that, you know, they ask me where I'm from. I say, well, I'm from Winnipeg. And then she looked at me and she said, why do they stop talking to me then? And I just looked at her and I said, Kendra, that's easy. They're judging you. She says, welcome to small towns, right? So we need to put ourselves in the other person's shoes. The other thing we need to do is create solutions. So you uh, saw that question that I, that I actually gave David this morning because it was very interesting to me how he was really drilling down on blame and good interview questions, and he was also drilling on, down on self-directed behavior. So when you have an issue, and many of you will have seen this before, and I don't usually present without pulling the bull out of the box, and as Heather said, discussing the undiscussable or the bull in the middle of the room. Beanie Baby Ox, if you find one, send it to me, because this one's wearing out from being squished really hard in family meetings. But you don't need, you need a talking stick. But the whole idea of conflict solutions is to attack the issue now our issue, and, and I've got my, Myers Norris Penny sitting in the front row here, and I won't pick on them, I won't even look at them. Well, I will, because you're such nice people. But the thing is, I have been a Myers Norris Penny client all my married life. And we talk to them about, you know, should we be buying more land? But we in our family, my son is 35, he's bought the seed company, he's giving us a very nice six digit income for the next 20 years, and if you take 200,000 by 20 years, you can figure it out in your own math head. But we have decided on our farm not to buy or access any more land. That doesn't mean we're not going to improve what we already have. So if you want to come skating at my house after Christmas, you're all invited. I now have two huge reservoir ponds that will freeze over and we'll have a great time on Lake Kendra and Lake Ian. We named them after our kids. We have irrigation systems now. We have tiling, and tiling in Ontario is no big deal. 
but in Manitoba, it's one way that you can make your land more productive. So we attack the issue, okay, we're not going to buy land, but what's the solution? Another one where some of you are going to get a little antsy is crying. Crying is a beautiful thing because crying and looking at your glassy eyes around the circle in a family meeting tells me that we are finally drilling down on something that is really important to you. And in Huron County, after we did the workshop on Thursday, we did nine hours of laser coaching. And I had a man sitting across the table from me whose eyes were bloodshot. And I look in people's eyes because Heather likes quotes, so this is for you. Your eyes are the window of your soul. And so I want all of you, when you have this lovely dinner tonight, I want you to actually look into other people's eyes directly as you're having conversations with them. Because I was on a dairy farm in Ontario on Monday, and what we noticed is that nobody ever looked each other in the eye. And I had to coach them and say, son, the, the son, daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law, could you please put your chin up and could you turn your head and could you look at your father and your father-in-law and could you actually say what you're thinking, feeling, needing, and wanting. And this is a beautiful moment in coaching where the daughter-in-law said, I just want you to know I love being in the barn, but I also want you to know I love my career. So as far as I know going forward, I want to do both. And again, it's on the board. I think, I feel, I need, I want. And with succession and transition planning, what's happening is I think we'll do it after Christmas. Oh, you know what? We'll do it after Ag Days. This is in Brandon, Manitoba. No, we'll do it after Mom and Dad get back from the South, which is Florida on this side of the country and Arizona on the other side of the country, right? And no, no, we'll do it after Easter, which, by the way, is the last part of March. Oh, no, we'll do it after planting. Do you see where I'm going here? What comes next? Spraying. What comes after spraying in June? Fungiciding. Did you know quilt is not something warm and cozy you put on yourself in a bed? It's lots of how many dollars per acre fungicide, right? We used to have holidays in July. We don't anymore. And then it goes on. And then what comes after quilting? Fungiciding. Harvesting the fall rye, which is on Ian's quarter right in his front window. What comes after fall rye? Barley, wheat, canola. What's next? Soybeans. What's next? Corn. And please don't be unkind to me in the elevator because I'm from Manitoba and I grow corn and soybeans. I've had men at ag conferences says, you're my competition from Ontario. And I said, no, I'm not. Pie's big enough for everybody. That's a whole other story. Okay, another thing that we want to deal on the positive side is reaching out. You, in your workplace, in your accounting firm, or in your farm, or in Syngenta, or at the University of Guelph, or at C-Team, where are you coming, or in Quebec, and uh, all the work that you're doing there, you get to decide if you are going to be what Dave talked about this morning, which is interdirected. Nobody likes me here. It's so hard here. I just can't do anything right. It's always somebody else's fault. Those are the people Dave does not want you to hire, right? You learned that this morning. So what you need to do is you need to reach out with curiosity. So here's the phrase that pays. I'm just curious, Heather. What do you really need right now besides more funding from Agriculture Canada, right? Ah! She goes, that would make her life so much better if funding wasn't always an issue, right? What do you need in this moment? And you reach out and you seriously ask the other person, what is it that you need that you're not getting? And I don't know how many of you know my story, but I have a long story of bumps along the road of life which we also heard about this morning, life is messy and stuff happens. So make the first move. And last night in the restaurant, I ran into Meg Reynolds and I haven't seen her in about three or four years. I grabbed her and I said, so good to see you. Because she's the executive director of Do More Ag Foundation. We also now have the Nat National, Mental, National Farmers Mental Health Alliance led by women and uh, counselors and therapists here in Ontario. I've been part of their beta testing with our group of coaches, and we want more ag-informed based therapy because you have to make the first move. And if you haven't taken mental health first aid yet, take it so that you can walk alongside to reach out and help families. Now, the other positive behavior is delaying 
delaying your response. And some of you grew up in homes said, that said, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Not true. If you can't say something nice, think about first of engaging your brain before you engage your tongue. Because there's a lot of hurt going on in agriculture. And Sean was also, so we call this delaying your response. So when Wes is in a very wet spring, let's call it 2011, it was a horrible spring on the prairies. We only seeded 500 acres of 5,000. But it was a very wet spring. And Ian was in love. And he's driving the air seeder. And he drove straight into a large body of water, which is on the prairies we call a slough. Gearbox. That's how deep he was. So when Wes gets to the field after a call for help, he doesn't start berating on his son and telling him what an idiot it is. He delays his response, he picks up his cell phone, and he said, what was Jim Fluker, the excavator guy, what was his number again? Okay, so then he phones Jim Fluker and he says, oh, and by the way, Ian, you get to pay the $400 bill because you drove into the slough. Do you see what happened? We don't have response around conflict, we, we have responses around creating solution. And the last positive behavior is how good are you, are you at being flexible and being ready? And that's why I, I, the real ag study research that they're doing that Sean Haney and his team is doing with Heather and her team is fantastic because now we're getting a better, more clear picture of how people can be ready for what happens. Now, I am known as Elaine Frey's farm family coach. My secret superpower, whatever, is the ability to direct and find out very quickly where the family is at. And I do this by doing a family map and by having very intense, deep conversations very quickly. But I am wired for communication and empathy and woo, and woo is winning others over. So I'm asking you today after lunch, Think in your mind right now of somebody who's making your life pretty tense. What is your plan when you go home from this conference to have a better, tougher conversation with that person and deal with the bull in the middle of the room? Are you ready for this? This is constructive conflict behavior. This is all the work of um, St. Petersburg Eckerd College, and this is it. The conflict CDP, conflict dynamic profile. So when Heather and Nick and I were planning this event today, we thought, wouldn't it be cool if everybody in the audience had already done this as a self-assessment to get more learning and more self-understanding? Um, so you didn't do that, but you still can. And if you'll put it on your feedback sheet, I'm happy to send this to you as a guide for free just so that you can have these concepts on. But what I would suggest you do is you pick up your phone because this is the slide that is the summary of what I just told you about good conflict behavior. Do you know what it feels like to be a farm widow and have everybody in your family bullying you about selling the farm? Have you any idea what it's like to be the daughter-in-law when you're losing sleep at night because you don't know what the contingency risk management strategy is for what happens if something happens to her husband. And in Manitoba, we have snowmobile accidents of younger farmers. We have cancer, we have brain tumors, we have all those things that you have in Ontario and Quebec and BC and Yukon and in between. So we never know what's around the corner. Okay, I'm gonna check my texts. Nobody's texting me, oh, except Sean. And I'll say, yes, that was me. So Sean, is Sean on his way? He's gone, is, John, is Sean still here? Sean is on his way, yeah, okay. He in low German is what we call the moose, he's gone. All right, now this is what you don't wanna talk about because this is what you may be witnessing in your workplace or on your farm teams. These are called volcanic events and the word volcanic event comes from a book called Fault Lines, How to Help Heal Fragmented Families. And the reason I held up the land issue of Country Guide is, is anyone in your neighborhood or circle of influence fighting over greed and entitlement? Any of you know somebody like that? Yeah, you know tons of people like that. So just for fun, I was testing out ChatGPT. And I asked ChatGPT, could you give me the 26 
common myths about fairness versus entitlement. Myth number one, fairness is equality. Myth number two, the eldest child is entitled to inherit the farm. Myth number three, all children should inherit equally regardless of involvement in the farm. I won't keep going. If you want this, again, ask me for it. I'll send it to you digitally. But the myth has to be countered by what reality? And the reality of equality is fairness often requires distributing assets or responsibilities based on individual needs and contributions. The eldest child gets everything. Really? The reality is inheritance should be based on merit and interest, not birth order. So what destructive responses to conflict are? One of them is winning at all costs. These are the bullies. What is essential here is you need to seek common ground. So in conflict resolution, another tool I want you to think about is when you're working as an advisor with your family, if you're negotiating where you're going to spend Christmas, you talk about what is it in this family or in this business that we all want. I want to be rich towards God, and I want to be rich in relationship. Wes and I went to seven funerals last January and February because we're getting older and we have lots of older friends. A funeral is a very good reminder of what's truly important. So these are the things that you want to do to counteract against the destructive behavior is I am going to get this farm and I'm going to do whatever it takes and I don't care if I ever speak to you again. Oh, have a nice life. Right? What do you truly want? Because you want to work on the problem. The next one is anger. And anger is an interesting thing because it's a secondary emotion. It's not really what it is. It's hiding three things. Are you hurt? Are you afraid? Or are you frustrated? And I had a young farmer in my presence on Friday. And he sat back away from the table we were coaching around. And I looked at him and I said, come closer. Because what he's doing is he's not sitting at the table when he goes to family gatherings. But he goes to other family gatherings where he does sit at the table. And I looked at him and I said, do you realize that you want to be the successor of this farm, but you don't really, really care about how much hurt you are causing the family by not caring to be even be physically at the table. So I want you to think about when you get angry or pinched, we call them pinch points, what is setting you off? And what sets me off is people who tell me, oh yeah, Elaine, I'll do this for you. And I'm a quick start. Mike Bossy can tell you all about Colby because that's his expertise. But because I'm a quick start, when I ask Heather to do something or when I ask my friends to do something, in my mind, once I've made the ask, it's a done deal, because I'm a quick start. And so you have to figure out what is setting you off. The other thing that sets me off is people who don't talk to me, which is you. None of you have talked to me. 204-534-7466. It's on the sheet on your table. I want to know of all the things that keep you awake at night in terms of unresolved conflict, What's your biggest pinch point? What's keeping you awake at night? Well, now that Sean knows that that's me, he's happy. Okay. All right? Displaying anger. This is also costing agriculture money because people who display anger and don't get it solved or resolved or go to therapy, what happens to the marriage? Kaboom. And then you're dividing a $20 million farm in half, right? So. I, here on county, we had a great mental health thing, and they took a straw bale. So let's do this. Breathe in. Four. Out. Mm, mm, mm. Breathe out. Okay, in French. Breathe in. Breathe out. And all you're doing is you have an imaginary square bale in your head, and you're breathing around the square bale. But if you have anger, it does help to delay your response, take a deep breath, and stay calm and carry on. The other thing that's happening in agriculture is we're not choosing our words carefully, and there's all kinds of terrible things coming out of people's mouths that people won't forget. And it's kind of like toothpaste. Once you've squeezed that toothpaste out of the tube, how are you getting it back in again? 
You're not, right? My number is 204-534-7466. And just so you know, I have mummy ears. Okay. Okay. That's okay. Go, Elaine. Someone's just cheering me on. Okay. Demeaning others is also not helping us because we have expectations in our head, like we said, right? But what are we doing to, to make people understand what is actually happening in our, in, our, in our own sense of reality? So on this slide, it says, watch body language, give difficult feedback well. And Dave gave you some great questions. It takes 15 minutes to be in that feedback back loop. But when you've actually got feedback from someone, then you have to act. And Dr. Gary Chapman, who wrote the book, The Five Love Languages, also wrote the book called when sorry is not enough. My husband is an act of service kind of guy. Don't waste your time giving him a card. But if you want to make Wes feel really good, go and clean up his pickup truck and do something. So here's a good conflict resolution qu um, question. What would you like me to do to make things right? Because I sense that something between us isn't right, and I'm just curious what's going on for you. So what do I take responsibility for and what do I need to do to make things right? Now many of you have mothers, all of you have one actually, but you know, many of you have mothers who are aging in place on a farm like I am, and the best Christmas gift you could give your mom this Christmas is a card that says, Dear Mom, I deeply appreciate everything you've done for me all these years, and I'm just curious, what do you really need this year? Let me know how it goes. Because people in Ontario think I'm a little bit wacko when I say there's lots of power in asking for what you need through the power of a letter or a card. And there's many people, and especially women in agriculture, and I know I'm a little bit pressuring the gender side here, but women in agriculture keep taking on more and more and more and more, and you'll hear more from the panel, but what is getting subtracted? And I have got people say, Elaine, I can't do this anymore. And if something doesn't change in terms of getting certainty around our transition plan, I have to go. I cannot do this anymore. And these are the women whose hair is the same color as mine. All right? So let's be careful about giving feedback and let's ask people for what they need. Another thing is the tit for tat that goes on with, well, if you got this and I get this and blah, blah. It's like a cat fight on a hot tin roof, right? So I want you to respond with what you need and choose your response, not react. It should not be a knee-jerk reaction, which is why delaying your response is such a healthy behavior. Another one, the mom who was sitting across from me on Friday, we had a Kleenex box. I always have a Kleenex box because I always need one. And she said, I, I said to her, I said, Mom, could you explain to your family sitting around this table what is really going on for you? And she says, Elaine, we worked on this dairy for so long, for so many decades. We had a horrible transition plan with my mother. She would not transfer her cascade wealth until she died. I'm the only child. I can't take this anymore. I have my family, and that's all I have, this family. I need the conflict to stop. So I'm a believer because I'm wired for hope and positivity that no matter how bad the conflict dynamic is in the people that you work with as an accountant or a lawyer or an advisor or on your farm family, I believe there's always hope. But you have to work towards creating what that hope's going to look like. And you have to respect people and build trust and not, not judge. And you actually have to practice forgiveness. And people say, oh, Elaine, I don't go to church. I said, I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about when there's an incident, when there's pain caused in conflict, what is your model of making quick repair? And for those of you who still haven't got a Christmas gift for your spouse, especially those of you who like to shop on December 24th, I would go to Amazon and order John Gottman's book called Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. Because one of the key principles is make quick repair. How many of you know farm families that haven't talked to each other for 10 years? That's not quick. That is not quick repair, okay? And then we get back to the point of, of avoiding. If you avoid something, is it going to go away? 
If you avoid something, is it going to go away? No, it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger like a volcano. And then someday, there's going to be the straw that broke the camel's back. And it's going to what? Explode, right? And that's what causes accidents. So you, you have to stop avoiding. And here's the magic question. I'm just curious, why is it so hard for you to come to the table to work this out? And the moms will say, Elaine, we can't do it ourselves, like do-it-yourself do renovations. And if you can't do it yourselves, then you call on somebody from CAFA, the Canadian Association of Farm Advisors. There's a whole directory. It's CAFANet.com. And you find a facilitator to help sit with you in this hard conversation so that you can actually talk to each other and change the story. And many of you are Brene Brown fans, possibly like I am, but here's her line. Being clear is kind. I have some hard things to tell you, but I'm going to be kind while I do it. I'm also going to reframe the story because I am tired of these farm men sitting in a, a place like this. Make me talk, Elaine. Just try. And I go, I don't have to be here. I have other places to go. I actually would love to go and watch my granddaughters play violin. So, Charlie, if you're not going to be coachable, then I don't have to be here. What do you mean? I don't get pushed around by people who throw their net worth at me and put their hands in like this, right? So you want to figure out what is that person needing? And then you use language like, I suspect. I suspect means you're not making a judgment, but you're coming from curiosity. I suspect that this makes you really afraid. And then a tear starts rolling out of the corner of that man's eye because I've hit something in a nerve. And I'm not training you to be therapists. Because remember, I'm not one either. Counseling is about recovery. Coaching is about looking over there and saying, like Dave said this morning, where do you want to be in one year? Not 20 years, one year. The other thing is, is if you keep yielding and keep saying, oh, whatever, you, okay, here's the yielding uh, language in marriage. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. If you said yes, dear, for 40 years, you're now sitting in front of me, you're 72 years old, your husband's 73, and here's my question. So Charlie, when I ask you what you want going forward in the next chapter on this farm after it's transferred to the next generation, you said you want to just stay in the sh at home and go to the shop when you feel like going to work and just doing work when you want. But Charlie, would you like to listen to what your wife wants? And she said, well, Elaine, I want to move to Winnipeg. I want to have more fun. I actually want to go to Italy, do a cooking class with my sister. He won't come, but where is it written? I can't go by myself, so I'll go by myself. And then I look at Charlie and I say, when is it her turn to get what she needs? And then Charlie, who's sitting over here, who now has his hands crossed, he goes, Elaine, you are so fired. It happens. Because as a coach, I'm not here to be liked. I'm here to ask hard questions. So the question for yielding is, if you've been yielding, yielding, yielding in the workplace and not getting what you actually want or need, my questions are, what do you want? And I'll throw this in for the MNP sponsorship. We love MNP. We've been with them all our life. But they have this smart farm transition workbook. Waste of money, actually. The reason it's a waste of money for Mr. Ambitious Determined, who I'm married to, is Peter Manis, who's in the Brandon office, who's our coach. He says, Wes. What do you want? And Wes says, $120,000 a year income. Check. Wes, where do you want to live? Wherever Elaine lives. OK, that's a good answer, because we want to stay married. And then third question is, what does fairness look like to you? And he says, well, you know, we want to set our one child up to be the successor of this business. And we have a disabled daughter, so we need to get her a Henson Trust. And we need to make her sure that she's met her financial planner so that when something happens to Elaine and I that she knows she's not alone. Now, way back in 2018 in Winnipeg, when this conference was in Winnipeg, we had a group of young farmers. It was a cry fest. But it was a good cry fest because what that small group taught us was that many of you young farmers are going to go back and carry on the next generation. I think, Heather, you remember this time. But what we discovered when we got the young farmers to ask, what, what are you anticipating? And what do you have control over? And what do you really want? This is what they'd say. We want to run this farm. We want to run this farm. 
but we don't want to have to take care of our disabled siblings, Elaine, but it kind of comes as a package, and we're not sure we can manage that. So there are some of you in this room who, like me, have two different children, one who can run a multi-million dollar business and a farm, and another one who cannot even hardly work. And where's the fairness in that? So the question around anticipating yielding and hiding emotions and finding fairness is, what do you truly want? And what is it that we can do as the founders or the, or the ones with the wealth to cascade the wealth in the next generation? What would make you feel that you are successful? So some of you have my fairness postcards on your tables, but the, the YouTube video is finding fairness in farm transition because that's where the conflict is. There's tons of self-criticizing going on and there's all kinds of destructive responses. And it's time for these destructive responses to stop in agriculture because there's too much at stake. And I don't want to hear about the neighbors. I want you to email me and say, hey, Elaine, I've just been practicing. I'm just curious. Hey, Elaine, I've been practicing. That was then and this is now because we can't afford to roll over all that land. And if I had five hours with you today, which I don't, the one other thing that will be transformational for you and especially for you young students, I want you to go home and ask your parents how much value of assets is there on the farm side. And many farms now are worth north of 10 million. That's not too hard to do, right? Not at all. But then I want you to look what's on the personal wealth bubble side. And this is courtesy of Merle Good, who, Wilson, you love dearly, right? Merle's one of the best consultants in Canada who gets farm families. And Merle and I were together one day in Alberta doing a thing. And he said, what is your personal wealth bubble? So just think about this in your head. You have $10 million on this side and the farm asset. But on this side, in your personal wealth bubble, you have $50,000. And I heard someone at my table in this room say, well, that farmer's retirement is in their, in their land. No, it isn't. Because some kinds of the assets can be purchased by the next generation, but that young farmer cannot buy $15 million worth of land. But what can they buy? And then I'm talking to the older farmers and saying, how much time do you have to build more personal wealth? Because 4% of $2 million, which is what I would like to have on the personal side, is 80 grand a year. But when you have a farm family who can't even talk about money, you're stuck. My chimes went off. It's now three minutes left. Does anyone want to... All right, do you have a Slido for this? Okay, let's do Slido. Can you flip us over, please, Greg? I much prefer texting because then I get it and you don't know what's coming, but that's okay. We're flexible. I am here till 3.30 tomorrow. No, we have two more days, right? Thir today's, what day is it? This is Tuesday, right? Okay, I don't have Alzheimer's, by the way. My dad did. But I've been in Ontario for a week and I've been doing a lot of work and my head's pretty full right now because it's my longing that your hope would not be deferred. Because if your hope is deferred, you are sick. What I want to see is the tree of life appear for you, that you know that you have worked hard and intentionally to get the life you've always wanted. Are there any questions, Greg? Okay. Elaine, when conflict gets really personal, I get red in the face, I start sweating, and my ears start ringing. I can't even hear the other person debilitating. So this is a, a physical body response which sounds like you're almost on the edge of a panic attack. And what you need to do is, is, is talk to a, a mental health practitioner or a psych nurse, a mental health worker, and get some physical coping skills about how you can de-escalate yourself before you ask for what you need. I was sitting in a beautiful brick house somewhere out of Ottawa, Ontario, with two brothers who were dairy farmers, and as we were going through the conflict, one of the dairy brothers had an out-all-out panic attack, and this is exactly what happened to him. His face started sweating, 
His ears were ringing, and he actually physically, his brother said, are you having a heart attack? And that is why you all, I am encouraging all of you to take mental health first aid, just to get some practical, workable breathing tools. The other thing is, what can you see? I see very bright lights and Christmas wreaths and a Christmas tree. What do you taste? I can taste the taco salad in my mouth. What do you, what do you smell? Oh, nobody smells because you're not allowed to wear perfume at conferences anymore. Well, whatever the thing is, right? But you do, you do a body scan as well. So when, you, when conflict gets really personal, the other thing I would suggest to this question is, what have you done to prepare yourself to talk about the conflict? So I had a widow in Alberta. Well, first of all, I had a family meeting with the whole family. And then we had this family meeting in an Edmonton Airport hotel room in November. Two days before Christmas, she said, hey, Elaine, I have bad news. I said, what's up? Well, my husband's just been diagnosed with brain cancer. He has a few months to live, and we still haven't signed off on the succession plan. I said, what's the plan? She said, we're going to get it done. So they did get it done, and he did die in April. But now we're back in October, and what she did, and this might help you, is she made herself a script. And she said, Elaine, I just want you to talk to the kids and I, because the spouses will get to them later. But I need a script because if I don't have something to, as talking points, I'm going to get off script and I'm going to be really, really nervous. So that's also another thing that might be helpful to you is to get your talking points ready in your notes on your phone or your iPad first. Elaine, how do you define merit for a farm family deciding how to allocate assets or plan the succession? So this really reflects back a lot to how Dick Whitman works, and I really respect. Re uh, respect his approach. What are the roles and responsibilities? And when uh, David was up here, he's, remember he said job descriptions? If you want my seven pages of Dick Whitman's job descriptions, just write that on your feedback sheet or let me know and I'll send it to you. But when you're clear about the roles and responsibilities and the jobs, is a farm laborer at my farm making $25 an hour? Yes. But is my mechanic making $40 an hour? Yes. What, what's the difference between farm labor, cleaning out bins, driving equipment versus a mechanic? What's the difference? Not, yes, yes, your skills. And this is where families and business have a really hard time because they have two children, a boy and a girl coming back from Guelph, and they say, guess what, you two? You're getting paid exactly the same. It's different skills. That's not a really good idea. But again, you're going to have to have a difficult conversation. My time is up. The board is very clear. I'm going to be around. I'm going to be around till this conference is over. And I have three beautiful grandchildren living 159 steps from my back door who I haven't seen in nine days. So if I start wanting to hug somebody, I'll pick Christine. And Christine... <laughs> Christine, I just want Christine to, to stand up. Christine is Christine Malseed, who's a Churchill Fellow from England. She lives in Cragford. Her, her farm is French Beer Farm. She's about to process her son and the Polish workers, 8,000 turkeys for Christmas. And if you want to have someone touch you and shake your hand who farms for Prince William and who worked for King Charles, go and talk to Christine because she wants to learn more about transition. Blessings on your journey as you create harmony, through understanding, because I know you can do this. Thank you.